This bee bomb is literally crawling with bees. Wow. I just thought, a pink onion, why not try it? Our hostas do well in Minnesota. They like our temperatures. We have things blooming from early spring to late fall. It's fun to imagine what this place will be like in a few years. We've just gotten started. Hello, and thank you for joining us on Great Gardening. I'm your host, Sharon Young, and just a note to our viewers, our May 9th show will be our last episode until we return later this year. So send in your questions while you still can. Tonight, our focus is fencing. Our garden experts will share tips about fencing for animal control as well as answer your regular questions. Let's welcome back our garden experts. They are horticulturist and educator Bob Olin and garden professional Deb Burns Erickson of Burns Greenhouse in Zim. We have phone volunteers from the St. Louis County Master Gardeners to receive your questions tonight. Call locally at 218-788-2847 or email us at ask at pbsnorth.org. Let's start uh, things off with some signs of spring. Bob, what are we looking at here? Boy, it's happened so fast here. You know, I mentioned the catkins, and here's some catkins from Alder. These are very primitive early flowers. What's so remarkable about nature is that they jump out before the leaves. Those are the leaf buds. If the leaves came out first, that would interfere with the distribution of the pollen. So they're out there on, on birch and on maple and willows and uh, they're out there in their glory right now, primitive flowers. And of course, rhubarb, which is jumping out, we're gonna talk about animal control. This is the only time really that deer will go after rhubarb. So if you have a heavy deer population, make sure you give them a chance to get out of the ground, and then they're gonna be resistant. And the first daffodils are out there. One of the other spring flowering bulbs, unlike tulips, that really the deer stay away from. So we're kinda suggesting that people start by thinking a little bit about planting things that maybe deer don't like. Or deer resistant, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Bob. So let's get to a garden tour. In 2023, we visited the gardens of Ellie and Kraft Dryer. Their home features spectacular fenced-in spaces for both the shade and the sun. Let's take a look. My name is Ellie Dryer, and this is my husband, Kraft Dryer, and we are on Anoka Street. On the north edge of what used to be Hartley Field. There was nothing behind us except scrub field from old Hartley Field and everything was just scrub except for the row of red pines behind us. The story is that those were planted in the 1940s by the Boy Scouts. So we put one garden on the north side of the tree line and a garden on the south side of the tree line. So we have shade garden and sun garden, which we call the rock garden. We quickly realized that the marauding deer ate everything in sight, and so we had to fence. We get an occasional bunny, because they're not bunny proof, but the deer have to stay out. Almost was not here when we started the project. So it's been an evolution. This is a ground cover European wild ginger, as opposed to Canadian wild ginger. And these have very shiny leaves and are very attractive. That little sign says, wildflowers welcome here. We just had that created for us because it's the line of demarcation between the regular plants and the wildflowers. With exceptions. With, ex <laughs> with a few exceptions, yes. The ligularia with the yellow blossoms, uh, I don't think you can kill them. They're very, very pretty. And the astilbes add a lot of color. And then, of course, we have to put in a lot of hostas because I really like hostas and they, they come in so many different varieties. Ellie and Kraft just showed us their beautiful shade garden, but there's more to see. Later tonight, we'll show off their sun garden and their beautiful shed too. But for now, let's get to some viewer questions. Fred emailed us and asked, is it too early to remove the pine needles he put on his blueberry plants he put in last fall? I, well, why, why would he? Why would he? He put them on as a mulch. Right. And he wants to leave them there. And the nice thing about pine needles is they don't break down very readily, but they don't acidify the soil. That's a misconception. And they'll keep the moisture in and... Yeah, leave them yeah, there. Yeah. Leave them there so don't, don't take it off. Mm -hmm. It's a mulch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Sandy in Finland, Minnesota is asking for advice or guidance you would give gardeners to avoid inadvertently bringing in the invasive jumping worm. I don't know where you'd really get it. I mean, 
Well, we're seeing them down in the Twin, Twin cities. cities. Right. Oh, so if you brought in from the right. Twin Cities. So I've possibly. advised people be careful about what may come from south of Hinkley, whether it be soil or whether mm -hmm. it be potted plants. Mm -hmm. But in this area, we haven't had the problem. Shop local. Yeah, right. shop local. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's good advice. Kathy recently had a soil test that showed she needed to add nitrogen fertilizer, 0 0.15 pounds per 100 square feet. She plans to add aged cow manure to the garden this year. The question is, should she add the recommended amount of nitrogen in addition to the manure, or is that too much nitrogen? What she growing? Well, that's the big question. And uh, nitrogen, she probably didn't get the nitrogen results. Oh. We don't give them on mm -hmm. a soil test because it, it uh, dissipates. So she's getting just a standard recommendation. And if she's growing uh, maybe a heavy feeder, say you're growing sweet corn or you're growing uh, cauliflower or cabbage, then I think some additional uh, organic uh, manure would be fine with that recommendation. But uh, I would avoid it for a lot of other crops that don't need the extra nitrogen. What do you think? Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, I'd be leery of it. And how is she going to apply it? And what, what source is she going to get it? Mm -hmm. We always need nitrogen, though. We don't want to minimize that. But there's such sure. a thing as too much of a good thing. Mm -hmm. Shirley in Duluth is asking about Innova Tree that was advertised last year in Bayfield. Do you know where and if they are being sold in the Duluth area? The Innova Tree. So I haven't seen them available. They were in Bayfield, right? But I haven't seen them locally, and I haven't seen them commercially available or really. Um, they're a relatively new introduction, and so production is a bit limited. And basically, that's Aspen. It's a popple. <laughs> oh. So um, it's got a great name and maybe some good marketing going along with it. But uh, be aware that this is not necessarily you know, a fantastic new native introduction. Okay. Gail in Brimson, Minnesota, um, found that last summer her strawberries became discolored and leathery. They started out fine, but by midsummer, many became like this. What do you think this is, and will she need to pull them up and start over with new strawberry plants? Well, I have a pretty good idea. I, I really think that that's a tarnished plant bug. Now that I think about it, the tarnished plant bug attacks that flower bloom right when the fruit is beginning to form. And she doesn't have to worry about them for next year. The plants are going to be fine. It's one of the most difficult insects to control and one of the real problems that we have with strawberry production. And she's probably going to have to either give up the crop or she's going to have to use some kind of a synthetic insecticide for control. And when would she apply then, Bob? It would have to be going early. Yeah. So it's, it's a real... It's repeated then? Probably not. Oh, okay. you know, it's, a, it's very seasonal, but uh, tarnished plant bug is a real difficult insect mm. and it causes our commercial industry uh, some real headaches. Interesting. Mm. Uh, Kathy in International Falls in Zone 2B wants to know how to grow foxglove successfully. Well, I haven't, I haven't seen a Zone 2 foxglove. Um, there are some that are available for three and very variety specific. There's an annual foxglove um, and it does relatively well. Mm -hmm. And so she could try to get some foxglove and maybe it would reseed, um, but I don't really know of one that's readily available for zone two. Right, we're getting warmer, but mm -hmm. uh, not, not warm enough in International Falls yet right. mm -hmm. for perennials, but right. the annuals the is annuals another would option. Be good. Mm -hmm. Betty in Moose Lake is wanting to know an effective and organic way to get rid of maggot flies from her apple trees. <laughs> okay, Bob. <laughs> we did a little work on this because we'd all like to do things uh, okay, organically. Uh, a spray program is, is really so rigorous that you're better off. What we like to do is just bag right. the fruit and anything you can reach for your table stock. You can use just a, uh, a simple baggy sandwich bag and you got to clip the bottom so the water drains out so bag as much as you possibly can as high as you can and then everything above that we just use that for applesauce mm -hmm. okay thanks for your questions and thanks for your answers moving back to the topic of fencing bob you wanted to talk about fencing for animal control yeah first i admire in the first clip the beautiful fencing <laughs> for deer control i think the first thing you have to ask is that what is it you're trying to control? Is it deer, is it rabbits, squirrels, mice, chipmunks, or perhaps your neighbors, your neighbors. in the view? Mm -hmm. So I think privacy. we're gonna let Deb talk a little bit about privacy fencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But on the, uh, you wanna ask the question, uh, winter or summer? We have a lot of options for summer control of deer, which is our principal uh, predatory species. 
But uh, winter can be more of a challenge. These are the trees and shrubs, the, what we call woodies. We really like metal fencing and people for years have been saying, save yourself a lot of trouble, build a, a good solid fence. They, you know, if you've got a large area, you really have to go up eight or nine feet. Smaller areas, you can get away with smaller, shorter fences because uh, they investigate this and they don't want to jump into an area and get trapped. But good, solid metal fencing. Um, in the summer, you've got other options. I think uh, electric fencing is a good, viable option. And then you've got lots of different kinds of repellents. And these are some of the protrusive eggs. These are some of the tankage pellets. Uh, repellents and you want to rotate the active ingredients so not just product because they can have the same or similar active ingredients you're going to have to reapply frequently then we have some motion sensor sprinklers that I think are quite effective but in terms of uh, maybe living fences Deb why don't you oh, address right. that so um, we get questions on this all the time as far as privacy and Maybe you, you don't mind your neighbor, but you just want a little bit more privacy for yourself. And a lot of people will ask what kind of shrubs. You can do a lot of different shrubs there. I, for Scythia's very quick growing, um, and I like to mix them. It's nice to, if you can do a monoculture and it's one thing, one species, but then you really see variation. If you see variation, it can really bother you, but you can add different species. Like if you wanted to do for Scythia and um, like even a hydrangea or cranberry or nanny berry, viburnums. You can do a nice tall, depending on your height, a lot of people for privacy, um, and then they can mix them and then you get spring interest, different flowers, different fruit, and different color in the fall. And so you can, and that, a lot of that stuff will get up relatively quickly and um, it can get up to six, eight feet tall. Mm -hmm and some real beautiful stuff. And you can plant for the natives and for pollinators and for birds too, yeah. with great, a living great fence. Great suggestions, but probably not for deer control and Correct. articles. Correct. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, keep calling in your questions and we'll answer some of them now. Um, that last shot there was yes. just some, uh, you know, a photo of an apple. A lot of people are gonna be planting apple trees right now. So don't forget, get the fence ready, get your collars ready because uh, they're watching you as you plant these <laughs> and don't think that you're gonna get through that first evening. So this isn't near as pretty as, as the ones we saw, but good metal fencing, a good collar around that main stem, and that's really important when you're putting in your new trees this oh, spring. Good, good topics, didn't mean to skip that. Thank you so much. Um, let's get back to some of your questions. JD in Mottawa wants to know if any local greenhouses sell Jolly Farmer products. I haven't seen them, I haven't. Ne I, neither have I. Mm -mm. Okay. I don't know of them. Yvonne from Ashland uh, wants to know when you should trim your lilac trees. After they bloom. That's right. Mm -hmm. Linda from Duluth would like to know of a vine or special plant to attract butterflies in a raised bed. Mm. Raised bed. Because I would say Asclepias or um, butterfly weed. Butterfly, butterfly weed. Butterfly. Um, but sometimes that root you know, it's, it's, it's a, hmm. but maybe the raised bed would be dry enough and would be better for it because you see it near railroad tracks and where it's really dry, but winter, yeah, you know, the cold running through a raised bed, I'm not sure that it would winter in that raised bed. Yeah, that's what you always have to be concerned about with the perennials. Did she want a vining crop? Vining or a special plant. What do you think of uh, morning glory, perhaps, clematis? Uh, sure. There are some, uh, there also are some black-eyed Susan that have a vining For an annual, habit. right, For if she annuals, wants annual. Yeah. Right, and it might be better to do an annual in a raised bed. Because mm -hmm. perennial thought. wintering mm -hmm. is gonna be a challenge. That's my thought. That yeah. makes sense. Shirley um, wants to know why some years her daffodils don't bloom. Do you have to feed the established ones in the fall or spring? Well, don't bloom at all. Well, oftentimes what happens is, oh. um, you know, you, you've got an established and these naturalize so they're going to be there one year to the next but grass can come in and they can mm -hmm. compete the trees can grow so you get a the little more shade gets bigger you get on under canopy. planting so so you you really need a lot of vigor in the plant so you get that down in the bulb so she's not getting enough growth during the growing season and a little fertility right now in the spring would be just ideal, with the, <laughs> particularly with the moisture we've got. And there you could use a little nitrogen. And would she be, I mean, I don't know if she cleans up too quickly and doesn't have it store enough energy, because yeah. some people do clean, you know, clean them up, mm -hmm. just to tidy them up. Yeah, let them grow as well. Let them as grow, can. yeah, so you can store some That's energy right. in that bulb. That's right, but they're great, they're deer resistant, they will oh, naturalize, yeah. they'll be back year after year, but you gotta get good vigor out of the growth during the growing season. Mm -hmm. Okay, Annette in Hermantown, 
wants to know if it's unusual that none of her hostas have started to sprout yet. She lives in zone 3A and have hostas in various locations in her yard. Other plants and flowers near them have already sprouted. Should well, she be worried? Well, I'm wondering, I don't think she should. I'm wondering if it's a really deep shade area that these hostas are in, and it always takes those areas longer to thaw out. They're going to be colder. We've had a lot of rain and a lot of cold weather. And so what I don't know that they're really gonna break. And if there's mulch on them, that keeps the frost in there longer also. Very so definitely. And she's away from the lake. Closer to the lake, things are warming faster, but it is time really to get that mulch off. Some people over mulched, I think I did, because I was concerned about an open winter and uh, too much cold penetration. That mulch has to come off now. We gotta get the mm. soils warm Warmed and growing. Up. Okay, Mary um, is wondering about her current bushes growing in her backyard that have produced an abundance of currants the past two summers. The branches are getting long and arching over, making it difficult to pick. Should she cut them back in the fall where they're dormant to encourage new growth, or will that kill them? It shouldn't kill them. It's no, it won't kill, kill them. Mm -mm. You know what I think, and you can give me your opinion on this, Deb, but I, I think if they're older plants, you can see the woody stems, mm -hmm. and she might prune out maybe 20% of the woody stems right at ground mm -hmm. level and let the others flourish, and this will encourage additional sprouting from the roots. So uh, rather than trying to prune, you're gonna take off flowering buds and, and damage your mm -hmm. potential for yield. So I would take off, I'd get in and, and thin them out, but only a few of the woody stems. Right, to the ground. To the ground, or 30%, yeah. yeah. Okay. Linda in Duluth uh, wants to know how much blood meal should she add to her veggie garden that is an eight by 16. <laughs> it's a little hard to tell, wow. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, application. Application. Soil test and... What's her and once again, this is a slow release nitrogen, so she'll get away with more uh, for the heavy feeders, things that really require a lot of nitrogen, which are plants that have great big bushy uh, vegetative material. And uh, it's, unless she gets really extreme, it's difficult to over apply because it's going to be a, a very slow organic release. Phyllis and Hibbing has two peony plants. One has beautiful flowers and one does not. Why is that? Well, I always go to uh, plant depth on peonies. Uh, where's that crown out at? Did she or did she over mulch? Or because um, a lot of times people get them in too deep, and I see it all the time that people have one that's a little bit higher, and it just takes that little bit of lift, and then um, the eyes come up, and then and they know where they're sitting, you know. And if and if they did over mulch the one, then um, that could be an issue, and could be sunlight too. Yeah, Does, is be. one in more shade than the other? Yeah, maybe a little nitrogen and not heavy feeders. You know, we use the rule of thumb, the three finger rule, when you're moving them in the fall, uh, you know, that those buds that emerge should not be deeper than about three fingers deep from the soil surface. So Including I, mulch too. Right, so yeah. I, I really think you're right. It, that one is in too deep, raise it this fall. There's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. Right. And just get it up a little higher. Good mm -hmm. thoughts. Jeff from Cloquet has a five foot tall arborvitae that lost some needles over the winter. Uh, currently. They're part green, part brown. Will they die? Well, they shouldn't die. No, they're not no. Gonna die. We, I mean, they're going to be aesthetically unpleasing for mm -hmm. a while, but you could definitely clean out that brown because it's not going to green up. No. You give them a haircut, shear them down. Uh, you know, not, uh, you don't want to take any of the green portion off, but no. they can be pruned pretty aggressively through most of the growing season. Mm -hmm. So, right now, oh, okay. They so could do them now, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Deb. And now let's return to the gardens of Ellie and Craft Dryer to see their sun garden. We have a rock garden. We built it if for no other reason than there was an abundance of rocks here when they bulldozed. Every rock in the rock garden was harvested off of this lot. Since it's nice and sunny, we can grow a much wider variety of plants. We have a gooseberry plant, juneberry, currants, and everybody loves the blue sea holly because it's just so striking. And the hollyhock is really my favorite because it's a different every year. It comes up where it wants to come up. It changes colors too. It started out bright red and then white and now it's pink. It's a beautiful shed. It was uh, designed with the help of an architect, um, made, made to, uh, custom made to order. It was a retirement gift from craft and we pretty much knew what we wanted it to look like 
So we employed Builders Commonwealth to um, design the interior and, and exactly what we wanted for an exterior. And a different company did the stonework all around it, but I, I wanted an ability to create it into a flower bed that reflected my Lithuanian heritage. The colors that are reflected around the shed are the yellow and the red and the green from the Lithuanian flag. In the back, we have yellow potentillas. We also have rue, which is Ruta graviolens, and that is the national plant of Lithuania. It's very, very bitter. That reflects the history of the country because they've they've always been war torn. Nazis from the west, Russians from the east, and it seemed a, a fitting a fitting flower. It's written in Lithuanian, and it means welcome to my flower garden. There's a different word for flower garden than veggie garden, so this is flower garden. What a beautiful garden. Nice fencing. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I love the fencing, but I love the themes too. This yes. is wonderful. And well thought uh, we out. really, really thank them for their nice work and sharing it with us. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's absolutely beautiful. Let's wrap things up with more of your questions. So we have a viewer that has tulips in a bunch. Should they be growing them separately? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it's my opinion. If they're really too tight, you know, then you're, you're going to really not get the kind of bloom that you want. So tulips really should be separated out. And the bigger the bulb, the bigger the bloom, right? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. How far apart should they be separated? Again, how big is the bulb? That's how right. How big is the plant? I mean, they tell you all this on the packaging. When Six to eight them. inches at least. Right. At least. Yeah. Cindy in Duluth wants to know if she should put manure on rhubarb for fertilizer. I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. As long as it's well rotted. Right. One quick caveat, we don't like fresh manure of any type on a garden. Oh. It should really be composted for a year. And then slow release, it's going to be fine on a rhubarb. Now's the time to get it on. Uh, where's the best place to actually get it? <laughs> I mean, From the cow. Good to always back. Again, there. it is, it is kind of tough because of cross contamination and making mm -hmm. sure it is well rotted. So yeah. Yeah. find a good source. Again, find maybe a farmer. Yeah, there okay. are there are mm -hmm. farms. Are they are being a little facetious, but yeah. there right. are commercial products. Right, right. And uh, they are, they're bagged, and mm -hmm. much of that really is turkey manure that comes right. from the southern part of, Mi of mm -hmm. Minnesota. But uh, if you're getting fresh local source, we really want it composted for a minimum of year. One year, mm. great. <clears throat> Um, Robert from Calumet has many wild raspberries. Anything he could do to make them better? Hardier? Hardier. They're going to be hardy. Yeah, they're hardy. He can thin them down, obviously. Yeah. He can thin them down, take the real small stems out so they have a little bit more vigor, some fertility, maybe a little bit of that manure. And, uh, but they're never going to give you the big fruit. Mm -mm. It, it's the hybridization process that gives us, and the cultivation that, that gives us the real quality. But they're smaller fruit, but real dense flavors. But spread them out a little bit, thin mm -hmm. them down a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Shirley um, has a three-year-old climbing hydrangea and wants to know if uh, she should be concerned about the basement foundation being damaged from the roots, or should she move it? It's climbing up a vinyl siding house, and she's in Moringa, Wisconsin. I don't think so. I don't think they're very vigorous. I don't see that the hydrangeas, the climbing ones, I mean, it takes a long time for that to generally climb. Um, so I wouldn't be concerned with it. That's so well said. I think that so many of our cultivated plants we're not concerned about. It's some of the invasives that we're more concerned than we are about these cultivated varieties. Mm -hmm. So what would be something that would mess up the foundation? Can you give us some examples? Engelman can. Engelman can. We're concerned about polygonum, the, uh, what people will call bamboo lo locally. Uh, we're concerned about that. and we want, That's invasive and a noxious weed, so we want to get it controlled. Julian Duluth uh, wants to know if we have recommendations for getting rid of an extensive creeping bell flower infestation. Mm. Well, herbicide. Y sometimes you can try all the covering yeah, that you yeah. want. People don't want to use any kind. You can you can dig and let mm -hmm. them regrow and cover, and but ultimately perhaps a fall application of some kind of a systemic herbicide that's labeled may be the ultimate solution. Right. I mean, you can try and try first. Try everything else first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See if you're successful. 
Melanie would like to know more about tree peonies. Should they be mm. pruned? When and best soil and light? Um, I don't think they should be pruned. Um, I mean, you can once they get started and see if there's any dead wood. Um, but generally, they're really pretty hardy and they're generally pretty vigorous. And um, like the Bartzella, the yellow, the coral, there are some really, um, uh, there are a little bit older varieties that seem to me to be a bit more vigorous and um, a bit more hardy than some of the newer um, breeding that they've done. But generally the tree peonies do very well. And they're magnificent and they're valuable. Absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, just take mm -hmm. good care of them. Again, maybe a little fertility in the spring. And then if they're not hardy, you might want to select one of the older, older varieties. Mm -hmm. This is Minnesota, we're all hardy. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, thank you for all your great questions. And that's all for Great Gardening tonight. You can follow us on our social media channels, on Instagram at Great Gardening PBS North, and on YouTube at youtube.com slash great gardening, where you can find tonight's episode posted tomorrow. Thank you so much, Bob and Deb, for all your great insights, and thank you for your questions. We'll return for a new episode next week our last one until July, where we'll answer as many of your questions as we can. From all of us here at Great Gardening, thanks for watching and enjoy the garden.